Hello, this is uh, lecture 4 in the series. Here I will give a recap at the beginning. Until the last lecture, I have derived the scattering amplitude for X rays and neutrons. For neutrons, I used Fermi Golden Rule and went ahead and derived the scattering amplitude and the intensity also. The square of the scattering amplitude will give us intensity. I did the same for X ray to compare the two scattering amplitudes and I mentioned to you in the previous lecture that uh, the scattering amplitude remains same except we have a summation over bj e to the power i q dot r j when we have a potential at the site r j and uh, this is for a delta function potential in case of thermal neutrons. In case of x-rays it is almost similar only instead of bj over some j I have something called fj and then e to the power i q dot r j part remains same. So this fj is the form factor which I introduced for x-rays which is the Fourier transform of the charge cloud at a point and which falls in space whereas in case of neutrons I had bj which actually if I plot fj against q it falls but bj it remains constant and I mentioned that this is because it is a delta function in real space for nuclear potential and hence the Fourier transform of the delta function remains same all over Q. It is a constant value in Q. So this is one advantage of neutron diffraction. But all the derivations done so far were for a rigid lattice or a lattice at 0 Kelvin. Today I will introduce you to the temperature effect for the same diffraction and then I will go over to bring in dynamics in our formalism. That is the proposal for today. Now I will continue with the lecture. So as I said derived scattering amplitude for neutrons, derived scattering amplitude for x-rays. So far we dealt with the crystallographic structure at 0 Kelvin no thermal effect. So what does temperature do? That is the question. So temperature causes thermal motion, we know. So scientists were apprehensive about the fact that when we have a finite temperature, then even if we have an underlying crystal lattice, they may look somewhat like what I am showing here in this picture because these are the mean positions the it's a square lattice so mean positions are indicated from the grid but at any particular temperature because of thermal motion the atoms will move and if I look at any instant of time it might look something like this. So the structural experiment I will come to it later also. Basically, it is an average of such instantaneous pictures, either over time and also over the entire ensemble of atoms or the whole crystal. So, that means at any instant of time, scientists felt, felt before the first diffraction experiment was done that there will be no regularity in the lattice. So that was the apprehension and I would like to share with you a bit of history just a little bit so that we know that this apprehension was not by anybody but some of the major scientists. So once Lawe had the idea that materials or crystallographic material can act like a three-dimensional grating in front of x-rays and he wanted to look at the diffraction pattern from this grating 
rating we the word is familiar to you we use in case of optical rays so i will just share this part of the history that he, he shared this this proposal in a, on a holiday the easter vacation uh, he was in munich university and they were in uh, they used to go to alps for skiing and he discussed this problem with sommerfeld and other wien all big experimentalists and others and what was the result the result was they said encountering a strong disbelief in a significant outcome of any diffraction experiment based on the regularity of the internal structure of the crystals because they said the regularity will be disturbed it was argued that inevitable temperature motion of the atoms would impair the regularity of the grating to such an extent that no pronounced diffraction maxima could be expected this was a view of the the most established experimentalist at that day dibai will later attack this issue and i will show you what happens but the fact is that it was also decided by some if not all that since x ray machines are available at university of munich why don't you do the experiment and i'm showing you historically the very first x ray diffraction that was done on copper sulfate the first x ray diffraction was done by two experimentalists and you will be surprised to know that these experiments were pushed in the busy schedule of the x ray machine in university of munich during off hours but this experimental results were first time you can see the lave spots or the diffraction spots on the photographic plate as expected by lave so this is a lave pattern today known as lave pattern at that time it was not called lave pattern the diffraction spots could be seen and very quickly they improved the experimental setup and they took lave pattern of zinc blend and zinc blend is zns and you can clearly see it is a single crystal the four fold symmetry over here and the three fold symmetry over here so it was established that the, even at a finite temperature at that time it whatever was the room temperature in the experimental hall lave pattern or the diffraction pattern do appear they don't disappear because the thermal effect will make the place or position of the atoms uncertain and kill the periodicity so dibai was want to solve it again after an animated argument at a coffee table in a cof cafe called cafe lutz and he writes i came to conclusion to the conclusion that the sharpness of the interference lines would not suffer but that their intensity should diminish with increasing angle of scattering the more so the higher the temperature peter dibai so what he said is this if if you see a lower temperature if you see a lower temperature pattern then you can see the atoms are located or say 0 degree kelvin the atoms are located at the rigid lattice size in a crystallographic structure now when i raise the temperature it is not that the atoms they run away from that place rather their vibration around the mean position increases so as if the atom is expanding in size with temperature and not running away so from smaller size the atoms become larger and if you remember i told you the larger the size of the atom but this is a dynamical effect the atom is really not becoming larger what we see is an average picture in time that because of the extend expanded vibrational capability of the atom it takes the as if it occupies larger space around the mean position and then 
because of this you have something called a de Bauer factor which is i0 the intensity at 0 degree kelvin it is to the power minus one third u square which is the mean value of the displacement and q square where q is the q will be g for Bragg diffraction so it doesn't get destroyed rather it gets diminished in intensity and in general the displacement is not spherical but an ellipsoid called thermal ellipsoid because in every direction the bondings are not same and the 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 solid will not allow equal amplitude of vibration in all directions and then it will rather allow an ellipsoid and this ellipsoid will be oriented inside the crystallographic lattice I am talking about. So it's called a thermal ellipsoid. Now I will give a simple derivation of this is important for us uh, that in diffraction now I will so if you remember I wrote and for x-rays this was a form factor it, I went to the most primitive part of it actually for Bragg diffraction Q becomes equal to G and then it changes and this FJ is the Fourier transform of, over the charge cloud now let me just write that this RJ was at 0 degree Kelvin what I wrote now at any time T at any temperature at any sorry at a temperature T it will be the the position at 0 Kelvin plus an oscillation around it at time t. This is what I have written. Comes and this tab ut it comes from dynamics and it comes from due to thermal vibration atoms and to be more precise it can it is coming from the phonon vibrations. So now the g dot rj it becomes e to the power minus i g dot rj e to the power minus i g dot ut this part is a thermal part so And we have to find out an average of this thing. So this remains fixed. So I need an average of this. So e to the power minus g dot sorry I need an average of this a thermal averaging uh, over the entire ensemble so now this one this term I can break open like this we can expand the exponential I'm sorry I'm missing an I everywhere this was an I my apologies I everywhere so I I have missed here so now equal to 1 minus i dot u because this is a g dot u plus other terms 
I under the assumption that g dot u is small, I can neglect the other terms. Then then it becomes equal to one minus averaging g dot u minus g square u square cos square theta. Now g dot u. You can see this is linear term, and u can be the displacement can be in this direction. If it is symmetric, it can be equally in this direction. If it is in this direction for a sphere, it can be equally in this direction. So g dot u, the average of this dynamical average should be equal to zero. And in g square. U square cos square theta average of that it becomes g square no averaging u u square. And over a sphere, I need to find out the average of cos square theta. So some of you must have done it. That average of cos square theta is equal to cos square theta theta sine theta. d theta d phi over a sphere 0 to pi and 0 to 2 pi and we may check that it will come out to be one third so then this becomes equal to one third oh, then this becomes equal to G square, U square, one third. I plug this back into the expression of expand where I expanded the exponential term, and it becomes one minus one third U square. G square. And I may put it back under the assumption that other terms are much smaller. I can write it is equal to exponential minus one third. Sorry, <coughs> it was half g square u square. So half, I missed this term. One half, one third in the expansion. So it becomes one sixth. And now it becomes. One sixth u square, the average value of u square, and some leverage g square. For expansion of the term, e to the power minus i g dot u. It comes equal to this. So now my form factor has. One sixth u square g square, and the intensity square of that. So I will have i equal to i zero square of that one third g square u square. That means that my intensity at zero Kelvin. If it is I zero, 
it gets diminished by a factor e to the power minus one third g square u square. So as we raise the temperature, u square increases, i increase, increases, e to the power minus one third g square u square decreases, i decreases. Also, if you go to higher and higher q values, that means you go to higher angles of diffraction, then the g value increases, again i decreases. So this is the most important effect that when we raise the temperature, when we raise the temperature, we don't lose the Bragg peaks, but because of vibration of the atoms around the mean position, their size increases, this u square, the size, apparent size increases to the X-rays or neutrons even, and then the intensity falls with the G squared is e to the power minus one third G squared U squared factor. This is a backdoor entry for dynamics. Basically, I am trying to evaluate the intensity or the structure factor for a lattice and the finite temperature brings in dynamics and also this factor. Just to give you a taste of it, I had did I had done the experiment with silicon powder using copper K alpha radiation. So I am just showing you that simple data which I took at room temperature and at 200 degree centigrade of silicon powder. The red one is the data taken at uh, room temperature and the black one is the peak, same peak at 200 degrees centigrade. So you notice that the intensity has reduced and that is the cause of thermal vibration. This is basically the Debye-Waller factor for this specific peak that I was measuring. But you have also noticed, I'm sure, that the peak position has shifted. We have not talked about peaks shifting in our derivation so far. This is for the simple reason that when I heated the silicon powder, not only that thermal vibration caused the reduction in intensity, but the lattice expanded. So that means if it is a 2D sin theta, this is a Bragg's law. If the lattice expands for the same lambda, the theta has to decrease to maintain the uh, equality in Bragg's law. And this is a signature of that. So you have the Debye-Waller factor reducing the intensity of the lattice and the expansion of the lattice caused shifting of the peak. You might have also noticed that there is a small hump here that is related to instrumental resolution. Actually, copper has two alpha lines, K, al K alpha 1, K alpha 2, and also K beta. There is a splitting of the two lines in the experiment. So this is an experimental result which really demonstrates that your Debye-Waller factor takes care of the thermal effect and actually in our diffraction experiments, this is also one parameter which is fitted to find out the thermal, known as thermal parameter, we can say that uh, the thermal parameter or the, ex or the extension of the extent to which the atom is vibrating is uh, given by the Debye-Waller factor and, and also fitted as a parameter and this is basically a powder, I will discuss this in more details later, this is a powder diffractometer uh, using position sensitive detectors, I am throwing terms at you and which I will explain later in which the data taken looks somewhat like this. Uh, this is how the peak positions come in a neutron diffraction experiment. They are fitted using a specific package known as Rietveld package, extremely popular today among all the people 
who want to fit their neutron or x-ray diffraction data and typically this is how it looks at a finite temperature but how long this will continue at i must say that the scientists at the beginning were not wrong when you keep heating your sample once the sample starts melting then the lattice is destroyed and once the lattice is destroyed the picture that i showed earlier which was the apprehension of the scientists that indeed happened this happened when the lattice structures starts melting you have the atoms moving from their mean positions it goes to a liquid state and you lose the black peaks we do lose the black peaks but till then till the lattice is intact it is the vibration which caused by the thermal motion and you don't lose the bragg intensity but you have a reduction in intensity uh, with that i end this module